Hello everyone, and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing a viewer-suggested case. This case seems to be solved yet unresolved, and it's the murder of Taylor McAllister. Let's get into it. In the early morning hours on December 22, 2016, a man was collecting cans in the alley on 63rd Avenue in St. Petersburg, Florida, when he stumbled upon something horrific. The lifeless body of a young female had been ditched in an alleyway behind some residential houses. She was wearing nothing but a gray t-shirt that was pulled up to her neck. She had bruises and cuts all over her body. Also, there were tire marks imprinted on her left arm and leg, indicating that she may have been run over. The police later identified the body as 22-year-old Taylor Ann McAllister, whose life had been cut too short by a ruthless killer, who to this day has never been brought to justice. Taylor was born in Melbourne, Florida on July 21, 1994, to Bill and Leslie McAllister. She was the second oldest of five children, and she was a happy and bubbly child who was known to love the beach, being out in the boat watching dolphins, and spending quality time with her family. She also had an amazing voice and discovered her passion for music at the age of 14. She taught herself how to play guitar and would spend hours learning different tunes and recording herself singing covers of some of her favorite songs. I wish I was special. You're so very special. But I'm a creep. I'm a She also had a vibrant personality and a big heart. Taylor's mother described her as being the kind of person who you would meet once and the next time she would give you the biggest hug and act as if she'd known you your whole life. Around the age of 18 in 2012, things took a darker turn for Taylor. She'd moved out on her own for the first time but got mixed up with a group of friends that began to introduce her to things and she started to experiment with pills. However, when she realized it was becoming a problem, she reached out. She told her parents the truth and asked to come home to remove herself from the situation. Her parents helped her, and she moved back in with them, and they didn't notice anything wrong, and they were grateful that they felt they had stepped in before things got bad. Eventually, she started doing well again, and she got a job as a waitress in a Japanese restaurant that was near her parents' house. It was there that she met and fell in love with a man named Josh. He worked for the Coast Guard. After only three months of dating, they got married. However, there was more to their love story than met the eye. Josh also struggled with drug addiction, and it was reported that the pair had decided to get married only after Josh was offered a job in Seattle so they could move away. During their time in Seattle, Taylor and Josh enabled each other's habits and got into a lot of harder drugs together. They had only lived in Seattle for a short time when Taylor called and told her parents that she was pregnant with twins. Taylor's parents moved her back to Florida so they could take care of her during the pregnancy. Once Taylor knew she was pregnant, she stopped doing everything cold turkey. In March 2014, she gave birth to her two beautiful twin girls. 
Taylor adored her baby girls and wanted the best version of herself for them. She planned on going to cosmetology school and starting her career. Unfortunately, though, she had to deliver them through C-section, and her doctor prescribed her Percocet for her recovery. After the birth of her twins, Taylor moved back in with her parents while her new husband stayed in Seattle. During that time, Taylor's mom, Leslie, noticed that Taylor was going through her pain meds faster than she should have. She kept calling the doctor for refills, and things only kept going downhill from there. With her getting sober for several months, but unfortunately, something would click, and she would relapse. Eventually, her addiction started spiraling out of control, and the once bubbly, full-of-life young woman became the shell of herself. Her parents tried to help her get clean many times, but at 22 years old, Taylor was an adult who was free to do whatever she wanted, and they would soon realize they were fighting a losing battle. It was Taylor that needed to want to get sober. 2016 had started super promising. Taylor had been clean for months, and it seemed like things were starting to get normal for the family. However, by August, everything had changed, and she had started using heroin. Taylor's parents had to take custody of the twins and had to make the difficult decision to place an ultimatum on Taylor. Get clean or stay away from your girls. The twins were now two, and they were doing what they thought was best for the toddlers, as well as Taylor's younger sisters. Taylor and her husband were living in their car, both unable to keep steady jobs. Taylor would start resorting to sex work to support her habit. Taylor met a woman who introduced her to Backpage, a website that was supposed to be for classified ads, however it was in fact the biggest marketplace for buying and selling sex. It was seized by the FBI in 2018 after investigators found it was a place where sex traffickers frequently placed ads. The woman, who acted like a friend, but in reality was more like a pimp, succeeded in making the whole ordeal sound much more innocent than it was. She convinced Taylor that all she had to do was model in swimsuits, then she would find men on the site who would be willing to buy her more swimsuits and pay for all her needs. Eventually, Taylor was introduced to a man named Robert Butler, He was more than twice her age, and he went by the name Bert, and was the son of Robert Butler Jr., the late founder of Bob's Carpet and Flooring. Butler had a lot of money to his name, and he allegedly became Taylor's dealer and was more than happy to supply her with the drugs she wanted in exchange for her company. In total, he spent nearly $200,000 on drugs. Despite coming from a wealthy family and being the heir to a renowned local chain, Bert was no stranger to the law. He had an extensive criminal record that included aggravated assault, battery, false imprisonment, carrying a gun at an airport, as well as multiple misdemeanors, including battery, drug paraphernalia charges, and three DUIs. In addition, he was connected to the overdose of a teenage girl in Manatee County. Butler took advantage of Taylor's addiction. When Taylor's husband went into treatment in October of 2016, she was left completely homeless. Butler convinced her to move into his home in Palm Harbor. It was reported that Butler was obsessed with Taylor, and he used her addiction to control her. He eventually confined her to his home and cut her off from all her friends and family. The last time Taylor's parents heard from her was in September of 2016, three months before her untimely death. Or she wished her mother a happy birthday. That's the last text. That's the last contact that I ever had with her. Three days before Christmas, on December 22nd, 2016, Taylor's parents' worst nightmare came true when they were informed of the death of their beloved daughter. At 11.30 a.m., Leslie was at work as a paramedic when she heard the devastating news. Simultaneously, Bill received the news at home in person. The first thought that crossed their mind was that their daughter must have overdosed, but they were shocked to find that police were treating her death as a homicide. When Taylor's body was found, it appeared to be severely bruised as if she had been beaten, and there were cuts and scrapes within her mouth as if she had been biting and struggling to breathe. There were also foreign DNA samples found under her fingernails and on her neck, as if she had scratched and fought against her attacker. Taylor's body was discovered 25 miles from where Butler lived. Also, all her friends and family said that she'd been living with him for months, so naturally, law enforcement paid him a visit. The detective who interviewed Butler at his Palm Harbor home stated that he had observed several scratches 
on Butler's forehead, nose, and forearms. He also had a fresh bruise on one of his shoulders. When detectives asked Butler for his DNA, he panicked and asked for a lawyer, so they had to obtain a warrant for the swab for his mouth. The results came back as a match. The DNA recovered from Taylor's body belonged to none other than Robert Butler. The only person's DNA that was found on Taylor was Robert Butler's. On her neck and under her nails, he had fresh scratches to his face. She had scratched him before she died. However, Butler was never charged or even brought into custody for further questioning. In addition, law enforcement didn't even obtain a search warrant for Butler's home, giving him an opportunity to destroy all the evidence that may have connected him to Taylor. They justified this by saying that the DNA evidence couldn't be used as proof of murder since Taylor and Butler lived together. And even though there were obvious signs of trauma found in Taylor's body, one of St. Petersburg's detectives tried to push the narrative that she'd only died of an overdose. Leslie had fought to see her daughter, but she wasn't allowed to until the body was released to a funeral home. Her family had been told there had been no physical signs of trauma, so they had opted to go with an open casket funeral. However, when Taylor's body arrived at the funeral home, they were shocked to discover that Taylor was covered in bruises and obvious injuries. Her mother described her body as looking beaten head to toe. She even went ahead and released autopsy photos of Taylor to discredit the SPPD's statements that Taylor had no obvious signs of trauma. But nearly two months after the discovery of the body, Taylor's autopsy results finally came out revealing that her cause of death had been asphyxiation and ruling that the manner of death was, indeed, homicide. However, they couldn't determine exactly if she had been choked or smothered, but she had severe petechia on her eyes, neck, and chest. The medical examiner even stated that it was the worst case of petechia he had ever seen in his career. Her autopsy also revealed that she had many health issues related to her drug abuse, She had hepatitis, kidney damage, and bacterial growth on her heart valves, all side effects of chronic drug abuse. Yet, her toxicology scan showed that the drugs in her system were estimated to be a week old. Taylor hadn't died from a drug overdose, which the medical examiner concluded it wouldn't have been medically possible. Taylor's mom, Leslie, worked as a first responder, and she stated that through the office grapevine, there was a detective overheard calling Taylor a junkie whore only hours after the discovery of her body, before any toxicology results came back in. Taylor had a clean criminal record, so this officer had made several assumptions before even investigating the case. This led the McAllister family to believe that detectives working on Taylor's murder case weren't interested in solving her murder, and they certainly weren't the type of detectives they wanted on her case. Leslie filed a complaint and was successful in getting the detective removed from Taylor's case, but he still works in the department. The McAllister family feels that there had been a strong belief within the SPPD that Taylor's death would have been ruled an accidental overdose. Because of that, there hadn't been much of an initial investigation. Why had Taylor been found nearly naked in an alley 25 miles from where she was apparently living? She didn't have a car. How did she get there? Who had strangled her? Why did she have skin under her fingernails? And that DNA that had matched Butler, why hadn't they searched the property where they knew she was living at the time of her murder? All of these questions were left unanswered, and the SPPD only had excuses. Once Taylor's death was ruled a homicide, the McAllister family felt that the SPPD went into cover-their-ass mode, attempting to string together a murder investigation months later. According to the St. Petersburg Police Major, Shannon Halstead, they didn't know when or how Taylor died, and they initially didn't have enough evidence to get a search warrant for Robert Butler's house. So instead, they put surveillance on the house and the people cleaning it, hoping to find new leads. They found that there were two men in particular who were frequent visitors to Butler's home, 35-year-old Deontay Baker and 25-year-old Kiran Archer. Also Baker's several girlfriends, were the ones in charge of cleaning the house. Detectives started looking into the two men and the girlfriends and discovered they were all involved in some shady stuff. They tried triangulating the location of their cell phones, only to find that each of them carried five to six phones. By then, the case file kept getting bigger and bigger, and soon Butler's finances also came into question when they found he was writing very large checks to them. 
In the spring of 2017, the FBI was called into the case to investigate several drug and money laundering ties that later grew into a full separate case from Taylor's murder. Months went by and nothing seemed to be progressing regarding Taylor's case, only the drug bust. Her parents were growing frustrated. They believed that their daughter was never given a fair investigation due to corruption, money, and connections in the system. It would take almost a full year to the day when Taylor's body was found for the police to go back to question Robert Butler, as well as the other two suspects, Deontay Baker and Kiran Archer. And after they heard the suspect's statements, a story finally started to emerge about the events that took place the night of December 21st, 2016, and led to Taylor's body being found the following morning. Deontay said that he was out partying with Karan Archer and another man named Desmond Washington when they received a call from a distraught Robert Butler telling them they needed to come to the house as soon as possible to take Taylor to the hospital. He stated that when they got there, they found Taylor in Butler's bed, she was groaning in pain, and she was barely conscious. She was wearing only a t-shirt and had urinated on the bed. According to Butler, Taylor had been ill for a few days, but he thought it was just because she was going through withdrawal. However, her condition had gotten far worse that day. He said that he panicked when he saw that she was in a great deal of pain and called Deontay and the others to come take her to the hospital. Deontay said that after finding Taylor partially unconscious, he told Butler that they needed to call 911, but Butler refused because there were illegal drugs and firearms in the home. Being left with no other option, the men wrapped Taylor up in the bedsheet and loaded her into the back seat of Butler's truck when they drove around supposedly looking for a hospital. However, when the police tried to track the route they had taken in order to come up with a timeline, they found that they'd passed multiple facilities that they could have provided Taylor with the help she needed. Deontay later said that they were worried about getting into trouble if they dropped her off at the hospital because she was a half-naked white woman and they were three black men. So instead, they wasted pivotal time just driving around aimlessly before they noticed that Taylor wasn't breathing anymore. They panicked and called Butler to inform him that Taylor had died in the truck. He told them they couldn't bring her body back to the house and they should just take care of it. The men spent time conspiring on how to get rid of the body. Baker admitted that at first they thought about burying her, but realized they were running out of time. So they just pulled over and dumped the body in an alley in a residential area in such a panic that they actually ran her over. Deontay claimed it was an accident. After they ditched the body, the men claimed that they returned to Butler's house to take it upon themselves to get rid of any evidence that would tie them to Taylor. Deontay called his girlfriends to come clean the house up, and they went to the store to get supplies to clean the truck with. Then they burned their clothes and destroyed the surveillance tapes at the home that would have shown them carrying Taylor's body out of the house. Butler also boxed up all of Taylor's belongings and burned them, including the sheets and mattress that she had slept on. Ironically, the process of destroying all the evidence actually took place after the police interviewed Butler at his house on December 22nd, so if they had actually attempted to obtain a search warrant, they would have found dozens of incriminating pieces of evidence. Butler had claimed he barely knew Taylor, and he hadn't seen her in eight days before she was murdered. He disputed that Taylor had lived in his house, despite multiple statements from friends of Taylor. Also, it's worth mentioning that in the autopsy report, the medical examiner stated finding white dog hair on Taylor's body as well as tape residue on her mouth and wrists, as if she'd been bound and gagged. Interestingly, Butler had a white dog, and the detective who visited him the day Taylor's body was found stated in his report that he had observed a roll of thick painter's tape on a table. When a search warrant was executed, law enforcement did find a couple of personal items belonging to Taylor in the home, which included her guitar and a monogrammed Bible. The items were returned to her parents. Items never found, and likely never would, are her purse and cell phone. Robert Butler, Deontay Baker, and Kiran Archer were only convicted of failure to report a death, which is a misdemeanor in the state of Florida. Butler was given a year, but only served eight months. Baker was also given a year, while Archer was given six months and served only four for his cooperation. Desmond Washington was never charged, even though he was rumored to have been the one driving the truck that ran over Taylor's body. Additionally, none of the men were ever charged with tampering with evidence, a third-degree felony in Florida and is punishable up to five years in prison. 
Butler and Baker were also charged with money laundering in that separate case. In addition to that, Butler's list of charges included possession of marijuana and felony possession of ammunition. According to court records, Butler and Baker pleaded guilty to federal money laundering charges. Butler was sentenced to 40 months in prison and ordered to forfeit $140,000. Butler's sentence was later reduced to 27 months. He was released in 2021. After Butler pleaded guilty in court to the money laundering charges, Taylor's parents gave the kind of impact statement you should reserve for murder cases. They asked the judge to give him the maximum sentence and take him into custody the same day to ensure he missed Christmas with his family like their daughter did in 2016 and forever will. Leslie recalled how she had to wrap gifts for her other children and two granddaughters while at the same time make arrangements for Taylor's funeral. She said that no parent should ever have to see their child in a casket. The St. Petersburg Police Department labeled Taylor's murder as a cold case, and despite the mountain of evidence, they say they still don't know where or when or how Taylor died, who was responsible, and if there was an intent to kill in the first place. To charge somebody with murder, I've got to have evidence that the person committed the murder, Chief Assistant State's Attorney Bruce Bartlett said. He added, There's a lot of suspicions, a lot of finger pointing, and I've got to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury down the road. To this day, Taylor's parents are still fighting and doing everything they can to bring truth of what happened to their daughter to light, and they say they will not rest until justice is served. They have filed several complaints about the SPPD's investigation, but were told that all complaints are handled internally, and they were basically told to stop bothering. Bill McAllister, Taylor's father, said, She deserves justice for what was done to her. We deserve it. Her girls deserve it. Our family. Someone has to be held accountable one way or another. And she would say, I love you, Daddy. I love you, Mommy. And I'm never going to have that again. Well, that is it for this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you like the content and what I do over here, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. If you can give this video a like, if you enjoyed the content, that would be much appreciated. It's the easiest way to help the channel grow. We also have channel membership as well as Patreon if you want to get more behind the scenes content or just to support the channel. In the description box of this video, you will also find links to all my socials to connect with me as well as other goodies. But that is it for me. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.